Thanks a lot for organizing this interesting workshop. And it's a pleasure to show what we are doing um, in uh, robotics for the sense of touch. And um, for this presentation, the keyword will be uh, neuromorphic, as you shall see uh, later. Um, so why uh, touch is important in robotics? I think that Yulia gave a, a very nice overview. Uh, just to reinforce some concepts, um, touch is used mostly for grasping and object manipulation, as you saw also in the previous talk. Um, but it's also very important when the robot interacts physically with the environment and with, uh, for example, human collaborators. Uh, this is very important for safety um, and also for, uh, you know, sensing uh, what is around the robot to plan um, actions, for example, uh, to keep the robot uh, balanced and stable in face of contacts with, um, with collaborators and how to exchange forces with them. Um, so if you look here, you see the ICAP robot and where you see um, the fabric uh, here, maybe I can change my, um, my pointer, so here, you see that it's fully covered with uh, tactile sensors exactly to uh, sense the contact uh, with the environment and with people. Um, the robot has uh, more than 4,000 sensors um, in what is called the large area skin. Um, and the sensors are usually uh, sampled every 10 milliseconds. Um, and you can imagine that this is a very uh, huge amount of data that is uh, conveyed to the, let's say, brain, to the computational unit of the robot. Um, but most of this data is sort of wasted because uh, touch is really localized in space and time. So you can see that uh, the contact um, of the robot with uh, external uh, things like the uh, contacts in the fingertips or the contacts on the skin um, is really localized. So most of the data that uh, is sent around um, in the robot and is then stored and computed uh, is sort of uh, wasted. So how can we uh, improve um, this with this problem um, is uh, a way could be to use um, inspiration from how nature solves a very similar problem. We have as well uh, a large skin with a lot of sensors, um, but uh, our system has devised uh, ways to uh, optimize uh, transferring the information about contact in a way that doesn't overload our system. Um, and um, a strategy to do that is uh, to use event-driven sensing. Um, in very shortly, we can say that event-driven sensing means to uh, send information only when there is uh, a contact or when there is an informative enough um, event in the sensory signal uh, that uh, is worth to be um, sensed and processed. Um, to clarify this, let's make a uh, comparison between the traditional um, clock-based sampling that happens in most of the, of the sensors uh, and the event-driven sensing that is typical of the neuromorphic technology and that is inspired on the brain. Um, so in clock-based sampling, you have uh, a signal that changes over time and you sample it at fixed uh, temporal um, intervals. And these intervals, they have nothing to do with how the, the signal changes over time. So if we make an example in vision, for example, here you have a, a frisbee. If the frisbee is not moving, you keep uh, looking at the static frisbee and sending this information over and over again, even if it's not uh, informative. Um, instead, if the frisbee is moving, it's moving very fast, but because of the Nyquist limit, you will miss um, this uh, change. Um, differently from this, data-driven sampling that is inspired in biology basically samples the signal every time it changes of a given amount. 
Um, so when the signal um, is not changing, so here, you will not see any data. But when the signal is changing, then you will see a lot of data. You will sample uh, in an adaptive way the dynamics of the, of the signal. And this is, as an example, sorry, a video of the, it doesn't, okay, um, a video of the output of an event-driven vision sensor. You will see events, so uh, small dots that appear whenever there is a change with respect to the background of the system, uh, of the signal, and you see that it has a very high temporal resolution and very low latency. So we can apply this principle that was uh, for the first time implemented in, uh, in vision. We can also apply that uh, for tactile sensing. So uh, here you see the tactile sensors on, on the ICAB robot. Um, this is the skin. Every little dot here is a capacitive sensor. Um, this is what you could see kind of, uh, it was below the fabric that the, that is um, covering the eye cup. And here you also have tactile sensors in the finger fit of the robot of the same uh, type of technology. So the first approach to implement event-driven sensing is to use the technology that is already integrated on the robot that has uh, still a clock-driven sampling, but we can uh, implement what is called soft neuromorphic approach um, in basically um, implementing the event-driven encoding um, at the first stage, very close to the sensor. And here you see um, what can be done um, using the signal of one pixel. So this is the signal recorded when the robot is uh, tapping with one finger on a table. Uh, and uh, so this is the signal acquired with a frame-based uh, with clock-driven sampling. And below here are the generated events from the soft neuromorphic uh, code that runs on an FPGA integrated very close to the skin. So to, to cut a uh, long story short, uh, basically you can, um, uh, here is the, the, the temporal uh, evolution of the signal over a longer time scale. You can use these events to reconstruct the signal in the, the colored line and you can see that if you even if you um, don't send information when the signal is almost constant um, and you use this encoding uh, you can still recover um, the signal uh, and reconstruct it uh, this is not really useful when you when you use event driven sensing but it's a way to show that this is a compressive a lossless compressive sensing so you don't lose information but uh, if you uh, kind of uh, measure the, the amount of data that you send, so the number of bits times the number of events with respect to the number of bits uh, and the num multiplied by the number of samples that are sent, um, you can see that using the event-driven encoding, you, have, um, you can save uh, a lot of um, data. So, you transmit less data, but you still have uh, the same information because you can reconstruct the signal. So here uh, is uh, a video of what happens on the robot. Here you have the um, samples, so the analog values acquired by the clock-driven um, front-end sensor. And here are the events generated by uh, the sensors. Uh, when you use the robot, you can uh, avoid transmitting this data that is continuously transmitted and only transmit the events uh, with the informative uh, signals. So for a tapping task using one finger, so only 20 taxes, you can reduce up to 80% um, of, the, of the data sent around to the robot you can imagine the reduction that you have, you consider the full skin with 4,000 sensors and not just 12. So, but we want to move beyond um, this and uh, have a truly uh, native neuromorphic tactile sensor. Uh, this is because 
um, to generate events from a front-end sensor that is clock-driven, you still have to interpolate the signal and you basically lose the advantage at the sensor level uh, to capture the full dynamics of the signal. So um, we studied um, a type of sensor that can be integrated with CMOS technology, that is um, the POSFET device. So the POSFET is composed by uh, a piezoelectric material that is here, that can be deposited on top of this uh, thing here that is uh, a MOSFET, uh, so a MOS transistor. Um, so this allows to integrate directly the force measurement uh, that is basically um, transduced by um, this piezoelectric material that produces charges on top of, of, the, of the gate of the transistor. And then you can read these charges from the transistor and integrate, for example, models of leaky integrated and fire neurons that can read the, the current generated here and transform them into spike trains. Um, and so uh, whenever you press, one of the two neurons uh, will produce an output firing rate that is proportional uh, to the input pressure. Um, and when the, re the release of the force, the other um, neuron can signal that there is this release of the force. So this can be done uh, using um, subpressure neuromorphic circuits uh, that are very low power. Um, and this is the block diagram. I won't go into the details, but the idea here, the, the important thing here is that uh, you use the poster, that is the transducer here, and you directly convert it into spikes using models of leaky integrate and fire neurons without having this um, intermediate uh, clock-driven um, sampling. And uh, if you use the circuit as, these, as it is described here, then you have a sustained response um, that is similar to the slowly adaptive type of, um, uh, of um, mechanoreceptors that basically uh, output the firing rate that is directly proportional to the input force. And this happens only when the force is applied. Um, but if you implement the feedback and you reset this measurement, every time you sense a change, it means that basically you are resetting the circuit um, to measure the difference with respect to the previous state. And this implements uh, a transient response that is very similar to the rapidly adaptive mechanoreceptor types, whereby the output firing rate is directly proportional uh, to the um, uh, to the rate of change uh, of the signal. So we implemented this in a prototype chip. Here you can see um, the layout of the, of the chip, where you have uh, the POSFET uh, transistor uh, and the circuits that, that uh, implement the liquid integrated and fire neurons. And here you have a picture of the, um, of the produced chip. You can see that the power consumption is very small for each taxel is about 20 microwatts. So uh, for 100 taxels, we still have a very low power consumption. And we also have very low latency because we don't have to wait for uh, the clock to sample the signal. But as soon as there is the change, this change is communicated to the uh, processing unit of the, of the robot. So here you can see a few examples of measurements. Uh, we um, produce a force, uh, we can read the output voltage of the phosphate and uh, the corresponding firing rate from the negative neuron and from the positive neuron. Um, and you, we can also uh, fit um, the output of the neuron with a curve um, that is a sinusoidal wave that is um, the same as the input. So in this case, we are measuring the sustained uh, phosphat activity and we can uh, show that if you can change uh, the amplitude of the sinusoidal wave, uh, we have an output that is proportional uh, to the amplitude of the sinusoid. Um, 
we can then implement the transient axle with this feedback that I showed you before and do the same measurements. In this case, when we fit the output of the neuron with, um, with the mathematical equation, then we get uh, the cosine, uh, meaning that we are really implementing the, der the derivative of the input. Um, and here is how it changes with the amplitude of, again, of the sinusoidal wave. Um, and if we look at the um, mean firing rate uh, for the sustained and the transient um, taxels, then we can see that in the sustained taxel, uh, the output frequency is almost linear with the input force. And for the transient, the output frequency is almost linear with the slope derivative, so with, um, with the change of the signal. Um, this is kind of was uh, the first proof of concept that we can implement uh, this type of sensing with uh, the prospect and with the uh, subthreshold neuromorphic circuits. Um, we are kind of moving on with this research um, and implementing more compact circuits. And uh, these are the preliminary results um, of a, a student that just started. Um, who looked at, um, at the different circuit that um, can again um, encode for the slope uh, variation in its output frequency. What you can notice here is that the output frequency is much lower and the circuit, even if I didn't show it to you, is uh, much more compact. So it goes towards the integration of on a large scale scheme. So, uh, in conclusion, going back to our you know, motivations, um, neuromorphic touch um, is uh, a way to go, I believe, in the implementation of, uh, of uh, large uh, scale skin for robotics, um, mostly because it's compressive sensing and has low latency and very high temporal resolution. And these basically give you uh, a technological advance um, when you want to implement uh, of robots uh, that can then be more autonomous in the sense that it consumes less power, has um, less computation to do, and so on. It's also um, very important to look at uh, kind of more closely how um, the, the tactile information is encoded in, uh, in biology, so looking at uh, how biology encodes tactile information and which are the um, characteristics of the spike trains uh, and the specific um, uh, sensory encoding that is performed to increase the amount of information that we can convey um, about uh, the, out the external sensory signal to uh, be able to extract more rele relevant information uh, from the outside world. Um, and the application can be um, improving the tactile abilities, the tactile perception of the robot, but also being closer to biology, um, we can use this information to improve the tactile and proceptive feedback of prosthetic users. So um, this is the work that is being uh, done um, within the New Touch project. Um, it's an European funded project that uh, started recently where we have um, people working on understanding uh, the, um, the neural encoding uh, in biology uh, of the tactile sensory signals. Uh, people doing a uh, computational uh, model of this and other people uh, developing new sensors that um, and kind of uh, capture uh, the fundamental characteristics of tactile perception and people implement integrating this uh, knowledge on robotics platforms and on uh, prosthetic devices. So uh, if you're interested in these uh, topics, you can have a look at the uh, New Touch website and also follow on Twitter and, and on the different social media. Um, and to conclude, I would like to thank uh, the people who uh, mostly did the work that I presented, that are Stefano Caviglia, Paolo Motoros, and Ella uh, very recently. So thank you for your attention. Thanks, Chiara. Um, 
great talk. Um, so let's see, are there some questions to Chiara? We have a couple of minutes. Yeah, I think there is one in the, yeah, in yeah. the chat. Do you want to read it, Inaki? Yeah, in case of fixed sample, how the sample period is chosen for sensing. In the I, I cab, uh robot, the 10 milliseconds, is it enough for safe uh, human-robot interaction? In case of adaptive sampling, is there a maximum possible sampling? What is the limit? Okay, so the 10 milliseconds is kind of um, the maximum that you can have. And uh, most of the times this is a bit reduced um, because uh, when you have many samples, you have bandwidth problems. Um, so depending on the application, if you want to have only few sensors active, uh, you increase the sampling rate of those samples and you don't um, uh, sample other uh, sensors. Um, and this is um, mostly okay for um, the kind of safety and physical HRI, um, but for example, it, this um, sampling rate doesn't really capture vibrations uh, that can be useful for um, um, texture recognition and for uh, slip detection and so on. Um, the maximum uh, sampling, let's say, rate that you can have uh, in uh, event-driven sensing uh, depends uh, basically on the on the arbitration scheme that you have uh, on the chips. So um, each uh, you, you don't have a predefined uh, sampling rate because it adapts to the signal. If the signal changes very fast, um, you can go to um, microseconds temporal resolution that is usually uh, very high and that is um, kind of useful when you have vibrations um, and that we use, for example, in vision uh, to uh, detect very fast changes. Thanks, Chiara. There's another question in, in the Slack channel from, from Risto Koiva. Thank you for a great talk. Uh, do you also detect, measure static forces with the tactile cells? If so, event-based tactile cells typically use a threshold to detect an event and suppress noise. How do you cope or plan to cope with the slow static force drift change and still be able to capture measure this? Thank you. Hmm. So, um, good question. Um, the, in principle, with event-driven encoding, you don't code for static forces. Uh, that's the idea. You, you basically, since it's uh, kind of redundant uh, information, it, um, you don't want to uh, send uh, data when there is a static force uh, applied. It's also true that um, some of our mechanoreceptors um, still convey uh, information about static forces. Um, and uh, one idea that we have and we are kind of uh, currently trying to address is to have a sort of hybrid uh, type of sensing um, that is similar to what has been done in the ATIS vision sensor. Um, so there you basically uh, sample the change and corresponding to the change, when, when, you send, you know, when, you, when you measure change, you can also measure the absolute value of the of the force applied uh, this basically uh, gives you um, a measurement of uh, static forces um, when the threshold of the change uh, is very small so okay. this could be applied for slowly drifting forces mm -hmm. okay i think that answers the question all right so let's thank yara again so, um, sorry, uh, one thing. That there is also another question that might be a bit, a bit quick. Um, sure. What is the rough size of these sensors when, when used at, as tactile sensors? Uh, this is a question from, from the chat in Zoom. But I didn't understand the question. The size? Yes, of the size of these sensors. Yeah, they're a, a, rough, uh, a rough size. Um, here. Uh, so this is the size of the full thing. Uh, we have the POSPET. Uh, so this is the biggest part of the sensor, and this is because you need to have you know, as 
a small part of the material that is sensitive. Um, and, uh, but this is in uh, uh, very old technologies, um, 350 nanometers. So you can uh, make um, half, so this part of the circuit, much smaller if you change technology. And, but this one will mostly stay the same. We are mo now evaluating a remote um, connection, so without depositing the piezoelectric material on the silicon, uh, but having remote sensors that then you connect with wires to this circuit. So this can be uh, very small, and then you decide the, 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 amp the size of the tactile transducer depending on your application. Thank you. All right. Thanks a lot, Chiara. Thanks again. So the virtual applause. Thank you.